Good morning, all. Well, all right. Welcome. And welcome back to the college that you love. For me, uh, this is an incredibly joyous moment, but also bittersweet. This is my last convocation as Bowdoin president. And before we get to uh, this morning's well-deserved honors, I'd like to share with you a few thoughts about the college today, about my time as president, and some reminiscing about the class of 73. Bowdoin remains, as I know you all know, a powerful, transformative experience for our students. It's different than when you were here, but in many ways uh, the same. At its essence, our focus on the common good and on an experience inspired by the offer of the college remains at our core. Now, last Saturday morning, a picture-perfect morning on the quad, we conferred degrees on the class of 2023. It was an occasion of enormous joy. The quad was filled with smiles and hugs, a real sense of community, and of course, an immense sense of pride and accomplishment. And this, what we did that on purpose. And we, this was in spite of an unexpected and an unexpectedly difficult college experience for our seniors because of the pandemic and all of the serious challenges that we face in the world. But as I said to the class at baccalaureate in this auditorium, this rink, a week ago, think about all that you've overcome and all that you become as a result. The truth is that you are tougher, more resilient, more savvy, more capable as a result of what you've had to face and overcome. And you should have a powerful sense of your ability to deal with and prevail over whatever comes next. This class will lead and they will change the world. And what I see in them makes me optimistic about our future. I also had the opportunity at commencement to speak about two recent Bowdoin graduates. Evan Gerskovich, class of 2014, and Justin J. Pearson, class of 2017. And I noted that they are great examples of believing uh, in something and staying true to that belief, even in the face of intense criticism, of threats, and in Evan's case, of the complete loss of his freedom under the most terrible of circumstances. They are models of dignity, of principle, and of strength and service of the common good. I went on to talk more about Evan and the particularly horrible circumstances he finds himself in. His pretrial detention in Russia has been extended three more months, and he continues to be denied access to U.S. consular officials. It is hard to imagine the nightmare that he's living through and that that his parents are living through as well. And we very much hope that he is home soon. We're grateful for the work that's being done at the highest levels of the U.S. government to obtain his release and hope that that work is unflagging until he is here. We've also been inspired by the amazing outpouring from the Bowdoin community on campus and all around the world among alumni. And in an amazing show of solidarity and support, the entire quad had a sustained standing ovation for Evan last weekend. And we hope to share the video of that with him soon. I would ask that you please keep Evan in your thoughts and your hearts. Now, this was our fully, first fully back to normal year since the fall of 2019 when our seniors arrived. And this year was a year that was rich in accomplishment, in fun, uh, and in work to move the college forward. And I want to spend a couple of minutes sharing with you some of what went on this year. We celebrated 50 years of environmental studies at Bowdoin and added the John and Lyle Gibbons Center for Arctic Studies to the unique environmental infrastructure that we now have that includes the Rue Center for the Environment, and the Schiller Coastal Studies Center, and the long-standing Bowdoin Scientific Station on Kent Island. Last fall, we honored Ken Chenault, class of 1973, with the Bowdoin Prize, our highest honor. And we honored my predecessor with the dedication of Barry Mills Hall for all that he has done for the college over so many years. Our Our students continue to benefit from career exploration and development trips during spring break. One group traveled to Silicon Valley for technology, two others to New York for finance and for the arts, 
and students who were part of the Bowdoin Public Service Initiative were off to the nation's capital to meet with senior government leaders. And during winter break, every single sophomore took, uh, participated in our sophomore boot camp. This is a week-long series of workshops intended to help them build both skills and networks for landing that internship and that first job. None of this, none of this work is possible without the incredible engagement of all of our alumni and all of you, and for that, I thank you very, very much. Now, just this week, we announced the cluster hire, our first in history of four new faculty chairs focused on race, racism, and racial justice that have been fully funded, funded by donors to the college. Two members of our faculty have been awarded prestigious Fulbright Scholar Fellowships for work that they do. And with respect to our students, for the third year now in a row, Bowdoin is the number one provider of Fulbright Scholars of all undergraduate institutions in the nation. Other honors include two Watson Fellowships out of the 41 of, uh, that were awarded this year, a Gates Cambridge Scholarship, a NOAA Scholarship to focus on issues facing the oceans, an Obama Chesky Scholarship for public service, and a member of the class of 2013, Matthew Bernstein, was named Maine's Teacher of the Year. <laughs> Our faculty received prestigious book awards, and they served on, as authorities on topics ranging from artificial intelligence to Thomas Jefferson to the nature of time to something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And in December, the 2022 Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to a Stanford professor, Carolyn Bertozzi, who recognized a member of our faculty, Danielle Dubé, for her work as a postdoc in the Bertuzzi lab, work that led directly to the Nobel Prize. And Danielle was invited by Professor Bertozzi to be with her in Sweden, and she jetted off to Stockholm to participate. John Dean was here for the 50th anniversary of Watergate. And fun and creativity permeated the campus with art exhibitions and dance shows, the annual Spring Gala, a colorful holly festival outside Brunswick Apartments, reimagined and student-led ivies, and all manner of other gatherings, big and small. And the Bowdoin polar bears continued to kill it with Nezcak men's ice hockey winning the championship for the first time in a long time. A historic finish for women's sailing at the national championships, an elite eight showing for men's soccer, a boatload of medals for our rowing team at the annual Dad Vale Regatta, and just this week at the national championships, they placed first in women's eight and men's four. And just outside, as some of you may have seen, work is now underway that will greatly benefit our varsity club and intramural teams as we reimagine and rebuild Pickard Field. Now, at, a recent, at our recent May board meeting, the trustees and the senior staff were really kind to Julianne and me and arranged for a wonderful celebration. And as part of that, I shared with the group some of the truly coolest parts of being Bowdoin president over the last eight years. And I wanted to share some of these with you this morning. Number one, being invited to perform with our improv groups. They were actually surprised I had game in this space. <laughs> Playing horse with the men's basketball team. They were not surprised that I had no game. <laughs> Having Honoran Chuck Lavelle of the Allman Brothers and Rolling Stones play Jessica for me in Stadinsky Hall. Thank you, Andy Sir. Granting an honorary degree to my mentor, friend, and one of the most revered members of the academic community, Hannah Gray. Being on WBOR, Dan, twice being able to go to the women's basketball D3 NCAA final game, being at the uh, men's ice hockey championship game this year when we saw them beat Williams. Sorry about that, Safa. Being at the ring ceremony for this year's women's rugby team who clocked their third national championship in a row. Eating again in the dining halls after faculty and staff were finally allowed to return as a function of COVID and remembering how amazing the food actually is here. The AFAM 50th and the 50th year of women at Bowdoin, such critical moments for so many of our alumni. 
providing one of our transgender students with the opportunity as a senior to re-sign the matriculation book as the person she is now and will be for the rest of her life. Visit <laughs> Visiting Kent Island, got a storm petrol there. The student art shows. Narrating Aaron Copeland's A Lincoln Portrait with the Bowdoin Concert Band's performance in Studzinski. This is the only time in my eight years here I've worn my tuxedo. And if you don't know Copeland's piece, go find it. It is incredibly important and relevant in the world today. Watching the Bowdoin Public Service Initiative students engage with Secretary Bill Cohen. They asked amazing questions and he was having so much fun he added 30 minutes to the hour that he'd given them, much to the consternation of his staff. Attending curling practice, yes, we have a curling team, and it is way harder than it looks. Teaching my first year seminar a few years ago and working this semester with four seniors on an independent study. Seeing Gibbons and Schiller and Rue to completion and along with Kent Island, creating an opportunity to take all of this work to the next level. Every single move-in day and every single commencement and of course, driving the Zamboni. <laughs> now, there's one here that's perhaps the most profound for me. And that's having intellectual fearlessness become a regular phrase that's used around the college. Every year since I've been here, in the first remarks that I give to our first year students, my welcome on the steps of the museum, my central message, is that they are here to become intellectually fearless. That the, the critical aspect of a great liberal arts education is for them to encounter and engage with ideas that they disagree with, that may make them uncomfortable, and that may offend them. And it is through this that they develop the knowledge and the skills and the intestinal fortitude to be able to confront the world's biggest problems and not to, to back off from them. And to seek truth and a, and a um, to, to provide an opportunity for truth to be heard and not to shy away from it. Now, just before commencement, one of my colleagues wrote an email to me, and I want to share that with you. I just walked by a group of seniors sitting at Dog Bar Gym. I hesitated to make sure I was hearing it right, and then I asked them, wait, are you all just hanging out, talking about intellectual fearlessness? Oh my God, we totally are. At that moment, I thought, my work here is done. <laughs> now, every generation has its own Bowdoin memories. Our 50th reunion class, the great class of 1973, is here in force this weekend and this morning. And I thought you all might enjoy hearing about a few of the issues that were shaping your college experience and some of the memorable moments on campus in your time here. The years that you spent at Bowdoin, class of 73, were bookended by the war in Southeast Asia and the Watergate scandal. And in the spring of your first year at Bowdoin, the bombing of Cambodia and the Kent State shootings prompted a strike at the college. Four years later, almost to the day, Senator Sam Irvin, about to begin chairmanship of the Senate Watergate hearings, arrived on campus to give an address and to take your questions and questions from others on campus in Morrill Gym. In the intervening years, Bowdoin became the first college to eliminate SATs as a requirement. The Afro-American Center was opened. Roger Howell was installed as our 10th president. We made the largest single purchase ever at that point on a computer system. There we go. <laughs> the governing boards voted to approve co-education and women became full members of our community. NESCAC was founded. The football team had a six and one season, losing to Wesleyan by only a single point, and the ice hockey team finished at the top of the heap. Concert goers enjoyed John Sebastian, Shana Na, Chick Corea, and their persuasions. That's some pretty good music. Cy Yu, and I will say I'm a Cy Yu, set a national president by electing, precedent by electing a woman, Barney Geller, as its president. Polar explorer Donald McMillan passed away at the age of 95. The college saw the retirement of giants like Herbert Ross Brown, 
Myron Jefferson, Burton Taylor, and Ernst Helmrich, a faculty with a combi combined 184 years of service to the college. Now, it was a time of immense change, and yet some things seem like they don't change. I'd like to share with you a few letters that were sent to President Howell following the 1970s strike. One parent described your generation of students as spoiled, overfed, rock-throwing renegades. <laughs> yeah, own it. An alumnus wrote, you've received my last contribution, at least until you are all replaced by a patriotic president and a student body that loves the country more than themselves. These were countered by letters from others, including this vigorous response to a national crisis can only add to the integrity of the academic community, which is the college's end and purpose. And this one. Bowdoin has at last returned to the traditions of 100 years ago, when injustice and immorality in government were not allowed to go unchallenged. As the French saying goes, and I will save you from my horrible accent, the more things change, the more they stay the same. In just a few weeks, Bowdoin will have a new president, only our 16th in 221 years. The search committee and our board did a tremendous job. As you have read and likely seen on video, Safa Zaki is an extraordinary choice. I've had the opportunity to spend time with Safa over the last several months trying to assist her as I can in the transition, and I can tell you she will be an exceptional leader for our college. Bowdoin is one of a handful of great colleges and universities in this country. We provide a comprehensive and rigorous education. We teach our students how to think, not what to think. And we prepare them for both success and satisfaction in life and in work. And we also make sure that any student who earns a spot here has the opportunity to come to Bowdoin regardless of their economic circumstances, which is both a core value for us and essential to remaining an exceptional college. And all of this is only possible because of you and your amazing devotion to Bowdoin. It has been the privilege of a lifetime for me and for Julianne to be a part of this community. It is the right time for this great new leader to set the next course for Bowdoin. But as I've said, this is a bittersweet time. We love being a part of Bowdoin, being on campus, being fully immersed in the life of the college, playing a part in moving Bowdoin forward while staying true to our mission and values. We love the time that we spend with all of you, our alumni, here and where you live. Beyond your devotion to Bowdoin, Bowdoin, you are warm and wonderful, thoughtful, and each of you has found in your own way an opportunity to serve the common good. Thank you for your tremendous support for me and for the college over the last eight years. Thank you for doing the same for Safa in the years to come. And thank you for all that you do for the college that we love.